everyone welcome to the official youtube channel of indian society of toxicology in today's session we are going to learn about poisonous and venomous fishes i am dr agnes j sirayak and i have prepared this presentation under the guidance of dr s venkat raghava many people assume that venom and poison are same but they are not although they both are toxic substances they differ in the method of delivery Here are some examples of venomous and poisonous animals. Similarly, in the case of fishes, venomous fishes actively deliver the venom using a delivery system that is by biting, stinging or stabbing. They do not necessarily cause poisoning if eaten as the digestive system often destroys the venom. Poisonous fishes in contrast are poisonous to eat. because the human digestive system does not destroy the toxin contained in their body poisoning resulting from fish and other marine creatures is referred to as ichthyism which may result either from intoxication by by stinging or biting or from ingestion of toxic or decomposing fish let's first discuss about venomous fishes Jellyfish are soft as they are 95% water and are mostly made up of translucent substance called mesoglea. With such delicate bodies, they rely on thousands of venomous stinging cells called nidocytes, which are present in their tentacles for protection and prey. Venomous injected using a nematocyst. It's a whip-like hollow tubule which lies coiled under high osmotic pressure. When in presence of a mechanical or chemical stimulus the lid of the cell pops open and sea water rushes in this forces a microscopic barbed harpoon to shoot out penetrate and inject the venom into the victim nematocyst discharge can occur in less than a millionth of a second making it one of the nature's fastest biomechanical process the venom is a combination of the following active substances Envenomation usually results in localized burning pain with erythematous or vinaceous lesions and regional lymphadenopathy. Erythema nodosum, arthralgias and anaphylactic reactions have also been reported. Delayed hypersensitivity reactions may occur consisting of pruritic erythematous maculopapular rash appearing at the initial tentacle contact points usually in 7 to 14 days after envenomation. The reactions spontaneously resolve in some cases while others recover after treatment with oral antihistamines and topical corticosteroids. Apart from the above mentioned general features there can be severe systemic manifestations such as profound muscle spasm hypotension acute respiratory distress respiratory paralysis cyanosis hemolysis arrhythmias and cardiac arrest. severe autonomic dysfunction such as abdominal distension urinary retention and dry eyes are common that can occur in less than a minute nematocyst can continue to fire even after a jellyfish has died so it is important to remove the lingering tentacles stuck to the skin rinsing with vinegar will usually render the undischarged nematocyst inactive sea water can also help in removing the residual nematocyst but do not use fresh water as the change in salt balance alters the osmotic pressure outside the nidocyst and trigger the nematocyst to fire stingos which is used as first aid acts by denaturing the proteins and long chain polysaccharides by interacting with the aluminum ions as well as osmotic removal of venom it is available in forms of gel and spray Borel solution is 10 to 20% aluminum subacetate also used for the same papain a meat tendinizer causes denaturation of protein constituents ice packs provides rapid effective relief for patients with mild to moderate pain from nidaria stings in a study it was observed that hot water immersion at 45 degrees celsius for 20 minutes provided pain relief to 87% of victims Initial interventions after nidaria envenomation are directed towards stabilization of cardiopulmonary abnormalities in cases of severe envenomation. 
secondary measures are directed towards the prevention of further nematocyst discharge which could intensify pain and enhance toxicity a stonefish lies buried in the sand mud or coral and is practically indistinguishable from its surroundings in addition to its excellent camouflage stonefish climbs the title of most venomous fish in the world the unknown foot of a water enthusiast is the prime target of this powerful toxin but otherwise the stonefish is content to be motionless until a small fish swims by quick as a flash the stonefish gets a snack Stonefish has 13 dorsal spines capable of piercing a shoe with a soft sole of 0.5 cm thickness. Each spine contains 5 to 10 mg of venom. This venom is uniquely distinct from other venomous creatures. This results in muscular paralysis, respiratory depression, peripheral vasoconstriction, shock and in severe cases cardiac arrest. The clinical features of stonefish envenomation include one or more punctured wounds which are anesthetic at first followed by local pain that increases in intensity for a few minutes and then lessens after few hours. The site is inflamed and sometimes cyanotic. The surrounding area is hypersensitive, pale and swollen. Regional lymph nodes are tender and painful. Distress may be disproportionate to the clinical features. There is frequent malaise, nausea, vomiting, sweating, delirium and pyrexia. Cardiogenic shock, respiratory distress and possibly death can occur in severe cases. Proper management of stonefish poisoning involves immediate evaluation and stabilization of the patient. The wound should be explored and copiously irrigated with sterile techniques. This cleanses the wound area and may remove venom as well as components of spine, lime and sand. Stonefish venom is heat liable. Therefore, hot fermentation should be performed until the pain is relieved. The wound may be infiltrated with local anesthetic without epinephrine if pain relief is required. General wound care should be administered, including antibiotics if indicated. The affected area should be elevated. Antivenom administration should be considered in cases of severe stonefish poisoning. This should be given as soon as possible after the initial sting, preferably within 48 hours. I guess everyone knows Stephen Robert Irving or Steve Irving, nicknamed as the Crocodile Hunter. He was an Australian zookeeper, television personality, wildlife expert and environmentalist. Irving died after being pierced in the chest by a stingray barb while filming in Australia's Great Barrier Reef. So, what is a stingray? Stingrays are unique cartilaginous fish with flat bodies and long barbed tails. The stingray's flat body allows it to sit on the bottom of the ocean, river or lake, camouflaging itself to predators swimming above as it hunts its prey on the floor. Its eyes sit on top of its body while its mouth on the bottom. Stingrays can have between 1 and 3 spinal blades. The stinger is covered with rows of sharp spines made up of vasodentin, which is cartilaginous material that can easily cut through the skin. The stingray is unique from other venomous animals in that the venom storage is not in its gland, but inside its own secretory cells within the grooves on the underside of its spine. Stingrays are not usually aggressive and ordinarily attack humans only when they are provoked, such as when a ray is accidentally stepped on. Contact with a stinger causes local trauma, pain, swelling, muscle cramps from the venom and may later result in infection from bacteria or fungi. The injury is very painful but seldom life-threatening unless the stinger pierces a vital area. The barb usually breaks off in the wound and surgery may be required to remove these fragments. Fatal stings are very rare. The death of Steve Irving in 2006 was only the second recorded incident in Australian waters since 1945. The stinger penetrated his thoracic wall and pierced his heart causing massive trauma and bleeding. 
The standard treatment for stingray injuries is hot water immersion as its venom is heat liable and can be inactivated by heat. Oral non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs or opioids were used concurrently. If there is suspicion of a retained foreign body, obtain radiographs, explore the injury and remove any foreign bodies as they may result in delayed healing and wound necrosis. Tetanus status should be enquired and tetanus immunizations are given if necessary. If there is evidence of necrosis, the wound should be debrided. Antibiotic prophylaxis should only be given for deep penetrating wounds, wounds complicated by a foreign body or patients who are immunocompromised. Lionfish are characterized by its warning coloration with red, white, creamy or black bands showing pectoral fins and venomous spiky fin rays. They are common to home aquariums. Upon stinging, the lionfish releases neurotoxic venom into its victim. A loose integumentary sheath covers each spine found on the fish. The sheath is pushed down the spine during envenomation and venom travels from its gland into the wound. Clinical features include excruciating pain in addition to local edema. The pain also ready throughout the affected limb. Other symptoms include parasitia, abdominal cramps, extensive edema and tachycardia. The most serious reported complications are isolated cases of anaphylaxis, limb paralysis and cardiac failure. Approximately one-fifth of patients experience local infection and one in ten require surgery. Management of lionfish poisoning is mostly conservative, that is by removing pieces of spine and clean the area with soap and fresh water. Apply direct pressure to the wound using a clean towel or cloth for controlling bleeding. Apply heat to help the venom break down as the venom is heat liable. The lionfish sting can be extremely painful, so analgesics are given and apply a topical antibiotic cream. Now let's discuss about poisonous fishes. Based on where the toxin is contained, the poisonous fish are subdivided into ichthyosarcotoxic fish which contain toxin within their flesh, ichthyohemotoxic fish which have poisonous blood and ichthyotoxic fish which contain a toxin mainly in their gonads. Based on the nature of toxin, seafood poisoning can be scombroid poisoning, ciguatera poisoning and tetrodotoxic poisoning. Now let's discuss each one in detail. First, scombroid poisoning. The main sources of scombroid poisoning are dark meat marine tuna, mackerel, bluefish, bombay duck, mahi mahi, etc. Scombroid poisoning can result from eating cooked, smoked, canned or raw fish. The implicated fishes have a high concentration of histidine in their dark meat. Morganella morgani, E. coli and Klebsiella pneumoniae commonly found on the surface of these fishes contain histidine decarboxylase enzyme that acts on non-refrigerated fish or freshly killed fish resulting conversion of histidine to histamine, saurine and other heat stable substances. The appearance, taste and smell of the fish are usually unremarkable. Rarely the skin has an abnormal honeycombing character or a pungent peppery taste which is a clue to its toxicity. Within minutes to hours after eating the fish, the individual experiences histamine-mediated symptoms like numbness, tingling or burning sensation of the mouth, dysphagia and headache. There can be a unique flesh which is characterized by an intense diffuse erythema of the face, neck and upper torso. There can be palpitations, conjunctival irritations, angioneurotic facial edema, bronchospasm and respiratory distress. This type of poisoning depends on the classical clinical features of histamine mediated reactions and by demonstration of increased levels of histamine and its derivatives in serum and urine. Capillary electrophoretic assay 
makes rapid histamine detection possible. Treatment of scombroid poisoning is summarized in the projected table. This table gives the symptoms and management of the poisoning according to its severity. Where mild cases are treated symptomatically with antihistamines and more severe cases need multimodality approach. The prognosis is good with appropriate supportive care and parental antihistamines such as diphenhydramine. Histamine 2 receptor antagonist such as cimetidine or ranitidine are also reasonable to administer because they can also be helpful in reducing the GI symptoms. Toxic substance removal using orogastric suctioning or adsorption from the gut by activated charcoal are reportedly used. Inhaled beta-2 adrenergic agonist and epinephrine are necessary if bronchospasm is prominent. Although rare, Another concern with scombroid toxicity is coronary vasospasm. Patients usually show significant improvement within a few hours. Since improper storage is the main cause of this type of poisoning, it is recommended that the fish be continuously frozen and stored refrigerated at the temperature less than 32 degree Fahrenheit until it is ready to be cooked. Next is ciguatera poisoning. This is the most commonest type of seafood poisoning. The main active toxin, sigua toxin, is accumulated due to the food habits of large fishes. This toxin is actually present in the dinoflagellates in the sea, which are primitive organisms and food of smaller fishes. When progressively larger fishes feed on the smaller ones, this toxin gets accumulated in them. Hence, it is said to have a snowball cumulative effect. This type of poisoning is endemic to the Caribbean, South Pacific and Australia. More than 500 fish species have caused human cases of ciguatera poisoning with the barracuda, sea bass, parrotfish, red snapper, grouper, kingfish, sturgeon, emperor fish and surgeon fish being the most common sources. Mitotoxin, toxin, ocidic acid, Polytoxin are different kinds of toxins involving in ciguatera poisoning. All of these toxins act as ion channel modulators increasing the intracellular sodium and calcium. Increase in sodium causes osmotic effects while calcium causes neuromuscular excitability. Incubation period is usually 2 to 6 hours but it can vary from 2 hours to as long as 24 hours. The hallmark of this type of poisoning is the development of paresthesias and reversal of temperature discrimination. But patient usually presents with sudden onset of GI symptoms like diarrhea, nausea, vomiting and abdominal cramps. The symptoms of this type of poisoning can be exacerbated by stress and ethanol abuse. Poisoning in pregnant ladies can lead to premature labor, spontaneous abortions and fetal distress. Ciguatera poisoning is determined by ELISA, enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay, and HPLC, high-performance liquid chromatography. There is also a rapid test to establish this type of poisoning called the immunobead assay, which is a dipstick test. Here, the treatment strategy is to reduce the amount of toxin available for absorption through gut by activated charcoal decontamination and purgation. Since diarrhea and electrolyte imbalance is common, adequate and prompt liquid electrolyte management is important. Antihistamines and cyproheptidine are also used to combat allergic reactions and symptoms. Myalgia caused by excessive calcium influx can be managed symptomatically by non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Hyperosmotic therapy with IV mannitol is indicated in severe poisoning causing neurological and muscular manifestations. Now let's see a case scenario published in a Singapore journal. A previously well 35-year-old Japanese lady 
with no significant past medical history presented to emergency department with giddiness and weakness of left upper limb and both lower limbs she complained of numbness and tickling sensation around the mouth areas there was no gastrointestinal symptoms when asked for history she told that the symptoms occurred an hour after having fugu sashimi for lunch at a local japanese restaurant her accompanying boyfriend has specified that they had ordered the gonads of puffer fish and those were cooked in hot soup he added that the soup was very tasty and that she had the major portion of it and he consumed a lesser quantity and he was asymptomatic so the culprit here is puffer fish biologists thinks puffer fish also known as blowfish develop their famous inflatability because their slow somewhat clumsy swimming style makes them vulnerable to predators in lieu of escape puffer fish use their highly elastic stomachs and the ability to quickly ingest huge amounts of water and even air when necessary to turn themselves into a virtually inedible ball several times than their normal size almost all puffer fish contain the toxin known as tetrodotoxin other sources of tetrodotoxic food poisoning are blue ring octopus newts and horseshoe crab Tetrodotoxin is a heat stable water soluble and non protein compound chemically it is amino perhydroquinazole it is a potent neurotoxin this toxin is usually concentrated in the skin liver and intestine highest level of this toxin is found in the ovaries and therefore females are more toxic than males as it is a potent neurotoxin it affects the myelinated nerve fibers and lowers the conduction of sodium currents at the nodes of ranvier it also acts as a potent sodium channel blocker the onset of symptoms is usually seen within 4 to 6 hours oral paresthesia with numbness and tingling sensation is usually the initial symptom of puffer fish poisoning after that it affects the nerve fibers ascending type of paralysis sets in usually within 24 hours cardiac manifestations like hypotension bradycardia is seen in severe poisoning dilated and fixed pupils indicate severe poisoning death in this type of poisoning is usually due to respiratory failure as a result of respiratory muscle paralysis Diagnosis is established by detecting the toxic substance using various modalities such as mouse bioassay, chromatography, spectrometry and electrophoresis. Coming to the treatment, as ascending paralysis can take up to 24 hours to develop. 24 hours observation is recommended in every patient. As with any other poisoning, decontamination is done with activated charcoal. Anticholinesthesis like neostigmine, etrophonium can help relieve neurological manifestations by increasing the levels of available acetylcholine at the nodes of Ranvier and neuromuscular junction. Artificial ventilation is life-saving in patients with respiratory muscle paralysis. In delayed presentation, the decontamination is effective and hemodialysis can be helpful. These are my references for this presentation. I would like to thank Indian Society of Toxicology for giving me this wonderful opportunity. Thank you.